So how are they produced in the brain? How do we get from neurons like this to conscious experience, like sitting in an auditorium listening to somebody or listening to music or, or whatever? How do we get to consciousness from this? Well, there's two types of, of brain of connections among neurons, and I'm gonna skip through a lot of this pretty quickly, so if you get lost, don't worry. We'll, we'll come back to something in, in a second. But just to say there's two types of, of synapses, chemical synapses, sorry, this is the chemical synapse shown here, and this is an electrical synapse, which is called a gap junction. And it's gap junctions that mediate uh, gamma synchrony and in sideways synchrony, which correlates with consciousness. So if we have a bunch of neurons and they fire with inputs and outputs, this is pretty much the standard uh, dogma in neuroscience, we get information processing, but where's consciousness? Where's, uh, where's, the, where's the bang? Where's the synchrony in this? Uh, we can explain the, in other words, we can explain the computerized non-conscious activities of the autopilot, but where's the conscious pilot? There's <laughs> just an example of one. Uh, this sideways synchrony correlates with consciousness in the gap junctions, and if we start to open up gap junctions uh, and get uh, this, uh, we get gamma synchrony, and we, get, we seem to get Bing moving around the brain. So the, it seems as though, uh, Consciousness moves around the brain in, in gap junction uh, networks. Uh, we know that this, this explains uh, the fact that um, it, uh, conscious smell in the nose is mediated by gamma synchrony in, uh, in, in olfactory cortex. And most interestingly, conscious feelings of pleasure and reward, whatever they are, are mediated through a final uh, dopamine pathway and uh, mediated by gap junction gamma synchrony in the dopaminergic nucleus accumbens. So maximum pleasure that we have occurs, uh, it, it's driven by dopamine, but it occurs uh, in correlation with uh, these gap junction activity, uh, gamma synchrony in this particular part of the pleasure region of the brain. But just being in the, in the uh, telling us where it is, doesn't tell us what it is. Now the brain is the classical neuronal computer, the mainstream view uh, that I, I've given um, so far, uh, has some problems. It paints consciousness as epiphenomenal because if, if you're doing something rapidly and you're responding to somebody in a, in, a, in a rapid conversation, the activity that correlates with what they said happens after you've responded. This has been found over and over and over again. So the mainstream view of, in neuroscience and philosophy is that we respond often non-consciously due to the zombie within our autopilot. Our autopilot is behaving for us and consciousness happens after the fact. And co consciousness has a, an illusion that it was in control, that it said what, what, the, what you said. Um, but because it happens afterwards, it's, it's assumed to be an epiphenomenal illusion. And this goes back a long time. To, for example, Thomas Huxley said, we are merely helpless spectators, conscious automata. Uh, it's kind of depressing, actually. Um, <laughs> This view also says that there's no possible non-locality, therefore no you know, ESP, telepathy, uh, afterlife, uh, spiritual connections are possible, they're ruled out. So anything like that has to be uh, false according to, uh, to this brain as a classical computer. There's also no explanation for the hard problem of conscious experience, why, we're, why we are not zombies, why we have experience, at least some of the time. Uh, and one of the problems, the final thing is that this view assumes neurons are simple bit states, on or off. They're just yes or no, kind of, kind of, kind of stupid, actually. But if you think about a single cell like a paramecium, it can learn, avoid predators, find food, mates, have sex, uh, no synapses. It's just one cell, and it does these rather cl clever things. If you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes faster each time. And here's a, an X-rated uh, image of two paramecium having sex, the two blue ones there and actually stay together very still for a minute and then swim off. So how do they do that? How do paramecium do that? They use structures inside of them called microtubules. And microtubules have been my intellectual passion for many, many years, almost uh, 40 years. And if you look inside a cell, the yellow thing, this is immunofluorescence of microtubules. They form, they form the, uh, the architecture of the cell, and the red is actin. So any extension depends on microtubules to grow out and form the connections with other cells, for example. In cell division or mitosis, the microtubules in red pull apart the chromosomes in blue uh, to these centrioles, 
And this is how cell division and mitosis occurs. And if this didn't go perfectly, you can have cancer cells result. Now, if you look inside a neuron, it's just chock full of microtubules. Here's the axon, and they tend to be continuous. And in the dendrites, they're interrupted. And they form these networks. And I got interested in these when I was in medical school in the early 70s because they seemed to know what, they seemed to be running the show inside the cell. And if you look inside a neuron, you can see underneath the synapses here are all these microtubules, and we're starting to see that they have a, a lattice-like structure. I was just learning about computers then, they were fairly new, at least to me, and I uh, started to think that microtubules might be computers. We'll come back to that point, but first let me tell you a little bit about memory. Memory uh, is modeled by something called long-term potentiation, in which a synapse uh, is the presynaptic area is excited pre, uh, at high frequency and then the, the, the synapse itself becomes sensitive for a long time. This is thought to correlate with learning. You get a, exposed to something, it changes the synaptic connections, and you remember the patterns through the network. Well, how does it do that since these proteins don't last very long? It's actually encoded somewhere in the cell. So one way it does it is through an enzyme called CAMK2, the memory molecule. The memory molecule then binds to microtubules and does something, seems to phosphorylate it to store memory. CAMK2 is a very interesting uh, molecule. I think the artists in here might, might appreciate the beauty of it. It's, um, here's the unactivated form over here. It's this uh, kind of flat, snowflake-shaped molecule. And then when calcium comes in and it gets activated, it kind of transforms like a transformer in the movies and these kinases extend down and up. And here's the, pho the phosphorylation sites, if any, anybody wants to see where they are. And we got the idea that, micro that these things might be depositing uh, memory on microtubules, and so we did a molecular uh, simulation, and sure enough, the size and dimensions mat match perfectly. So here's a picture of a, uh, a CAMK2 nano poodle, we call it. Uh, lined up perfectly on the, uh, on the lattice of the microtubule. And we proposed a, a memory code based on CAMK2 phosphorylating uh, parts of the microtubule lattice. Now this is relevant, uh, microtubules of memory are relevant to Alzheimer's disease because <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease re uh, involves microtubules. So here's a normal neuron over here, and here's uh, Alzheimer neurons. And you can see they're kind of crinkled up. And there's two lesions. There are these amyloid plaques, which are outside the neurons, between the neurons. And there's neurofibrillary tangles, which are inside, which are microtubules, which have sort of disintegrated and fallen apart. So here's the microtubule falling apart over here, forming neurofibrillary tangles. So, and here's the diseased uh, micro, neuron microtubule. So if you look in the brain of Alzheimer's <coughs> patients, they have these plaques and these tangles. Um, the tau protein that falls off is actually the traffic signal to tell the uh, motor proteins when to get off and how to uh, uh, adjust synapses. So this whole process is, is very much tied up with memory. And uh, my colleague uh, Rudy Tanzi at, at Harvard uh, recently uh, showed that the plaques call, cause reduced zinc, which then causes the microtubules to destabilize making a connection between those two things. So here's a microtubule. And to go back to the story of information processing in microtubule, I got the idea in the early, in the 70s actually, that microtubules might be computers. And I was learning about computers. And uh, beginning in the 80s, uh, working with a number of people, including uh, uh, Dane uh, Steen Rasmussen, uh, who's uh, now at Odin's, uh, we developed a model of microtubule automata in which each subunit of a microtubule, shown here, could be in two different states, switching back and forth like bits in a computer, or be in quantum superposition of both states. That actually came later. And uh, the idea was that microtubules could process information, and we're processing information inside of our cells so that it's not just neuron to neuron communication, but also inside. And we get information processing because of this type of activity with uh, uh, quantum forces in these hydrophobic pockets, they're called electrons moving back and forth, going into superposition. Now this, this basically says that the state of the protein in the microtubule is controlled by, controlled by quantum level forces and are inhibited by anesthetics. Now there's another class of drugs that are relevant to quantum forces, 
which would do the opposite of anesthetics. Anesthetics impair or, or stop the uh, electron mobility, the London forces they're called in these hydrophobic regions. But these drugs, including <clears throat> neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin, but also the psychedelics and, and also chocolate, uh, have uh, the same quantum uh, interactions or can donate quantum energy and information to the molecule. And this was shown in the 1970s in several studies and raised the system in the brain, the receptors and whatever associated proteins, more into a quantum state. At least that's what it uh, appears. And suggesting that, that uh, psychedelics may actually promote a, a more a quantum state in the brain, push you more into the quantum state. So that gets us into quantum uh, physics, and I think I've come to the conclusion that it's necessary to go to quantum physics to understand consciousness. I was uh, suggesting to people that all the information processing in microtubules uh, were necessary, but they said, well, how would that explain pain, joy, love, feelings, consciousness, you know, the hard problem? And I had to admit they were right. And at that point in the early 90s, I read a book by Roger Penrose who suggested a quantum physics mechanism for consciousness. And, but he didn't have a structure, and I, had, uh, I didn't have a mechanism, so we teamed up and uh, developed a theory. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the quantum world. And I realize there's some quantum physicists in the room, so uh, we'll see how we do here. But um, the first is that qu particles can exist in multiple states or locations simultaneously, superposition. Uh, they can also be connected when separated, connected over distance and time. This is entanglement. Multiple particles can condense into one quantum coherence, and location and momentum are indeterminate together, uncertainty. Now, in a more general sense, if you look at the quantum world, at least in the sense of quantum consciousness possibilities, uh, versus the classical world, Quantum is multiple coexisting as opposed to definite, deep interconnectedness as opposed to isolated and disconnectedness, uh, timeless versus having a flow of time, Act, perhaps access to a universal mind uh, in the dark, perhaps spiritual versus material. So I think that's one way of, of looking at the distinction. Now we don't see quantum properties in our real world. We don't see things in two places at once. And Schrodinger had this famous thought experiment, Schrodinger's cat, of a cat coupled to a quantum event so that the cat was both dead and alive until someone opened the box and looked at it. This is, this is called the Copenhagen interpretation because Niels Bohr promoted it. Um, but it. And it worked, it was pragmatic, but it put consciousness outside science. So it was good for quantum physics, but it put consciousness outside science and I think made, kind of delayed the, the uh, development of, of good theories about consciousness. Another possible explanation for why we don't see superpositions is the multiple worlds hypothesis, that every time there's a superposition, each possibility branches off to a whole new universe. And many, many people believe this. Another possibility uh, was put forth by Roger Penrose, Sir Roger, uh, who said that there's an objective threshold for quantum state collapse or reduction and a superposition a separation in the universe would only go so far and then collapse to one state or the other, that these separations were unstable. And that this would, could be given by a simple equation, E equals H over T, and that this relatively rare occurrence is a process on the edge between the quantum classical worlds and is equivalent to consciousness. So he put the bing into science. He said that every time that there's this particular type of self-collapse, self quantum state reduction, there would be a moment of consciousness, which suggested that since he was tying this to fundamental reality, that consciousness or its precursors are built into the most basic level of the universe. Well, as I said, he didn't have a good structure for his mechanism, uh, so that's how we got into microtubules. But let me uh, talk a little bit about how he developed this idea. He started with the idea that, um, that matter is more or less equivalent to curvature, or at least the location of matter, coming from Einstein's general relativity uh, which says that the universe has an underlying structure which curves and that space-time curvature is equivalent to matter. Uh, and if you go down, but this fabric of space-time, this actual, uh, 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 what it's made of in a sense, is down at the Planck scale t at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And if you go down at that level, go down and down and down, you eventually find it and there's information there. It's coarse, it's irregular. It has information. It's quantized in some sense. You know, we, we argue about exactly how to get there and what it, what it is, but I think uh, there's a fair agreement that there's some kind of information embedded there. Uh, 